Hi there, my name's Gerald Griffiths and I'm here with my colleague, Allison Lee. We're management side labor and employment lawyers here to speak with you today about employment agreements and how they're a tool to provide certainty in uncertain times. Hi everyone and thanks Gerald for the introduction. So first question for you, Gerald, why is an employment agreement such an important tool for an employer, uh, both in pandemic times and otherwise? Well, they set forth the terms and conditions and the expectations of employment, but the biggest reason, in my view, it is generally important is that it sets forth uh, or can set forth the uh, termination entitlements for an employee. An enforceable termination provision can significantly limit what an employer has to pay an employee on termination of employment. Common law entitlements to reasonable notice can be very costly here in Ontario. We've, uh, and entitlements to pay in lieu of notice can reach as high as 24 months or more in exceptional circumstances. We've seen a few cases suggest that perhaps notice periods might be higher in the context of the pandemic. But whereas under the Employment Standards Act, we have entitlements upon termination for pay instead of notice that are capped at eight weeks notice or pay instead of notice and severance pay entitlements capped at 20 weeks, 26 weeks severance pay. That's a huge difference in what you need to provide an employee upon termination. And we can enter into an agreement with an employee that limits entitlements to those ESA entitlements. During an economic downturn, if an employer has to terminate all or part of the workforce, and these are difficult uh, tasks that employers have been faced with during this time, the liability can be significant. An employment agreement can both limit this liability and provide certainty about the cost associated with a workplace reduction. But that's one term you find in an employment agreement. Allison, when we look back at some of the lessons learned from the pandemic, what are some of the key terms in your view an employer should ensure it includes in its employment agreements to be prepared for uncertain times? Right, so besides termination clauses, which you've covered really well there, Gerald, I think there's three things we'd be looking at. The first is temporary layoff language, uh, because if there's one thing we learned during a pandemic, it's that these clauses should be in any agreement where you might need to put the person on layoff, even if you think a layoff is somewhat unlikely, uh, because of course, sometimes you find yourself in a global pandemic. If you don't have such a clause, and there's no prior history of layoffs, putting an employee on layoff may be a substantive and unilateral change such, such that they're constructively dismissed, which means you're effectively terminating them when you put them on layoff. Uh, and that can obviously be a big problem because that's probably not what you meant to do. Secondly, you'll probably want a clause that states that a change to work location or assignment, again, doesn't amount to a constructive dismissal. During the pandemic, and particularly in the hospitality and restaurant industries, we've seen plenty of occasions where employees need to be moved from one work location to another, or their jobs or duties need to be modified or changed. Again, if you don't have such a clause that permits these, these duties and changes, and it's a substantive change, you may be automatically causing a constructive dismissal when you impose this change. Again, probably not what you intended to do. With such a clause, we're just going to note that you still have to be reasonable, though, in the changes that you're making. Third, sometimes we get questions from employers and so on about a force majeure, a force majeure clause, uh, which, of course, is a clause that addresses unexpected circumstances that mean that the contract cannot be fulfilled. The problem is that you normally see those types of clauses in commercial insurance contracts and employment laws a little bit different. Because of the way employment law functions, a really strong termination clause may offer you more protection than anything else or any type of force majeure clause. Of course, however, it's still something you could contemplate and discuss with a lawyer. Next question for you, Gerald. Uh, many in-house counsel are familiar with the constant litigation in Ontario about the enforceability of termination provisions. What do these decisions tell us about what a termination provision should and should not include. So the case law has been evolving over the years and we've gotten to the point now that when we look to try to draft or interpret a termination provision in an employment context, we can't put our normal contractual interpretation principles hats on. Instead, particularly here in Ontario, 
our courts have adopted a different approach in interpreting employment agreements and termination provisions in particular. If a termination clause could be unenforceable in some respect, it's void ab initio, even if that aspect of the termination clause isn't engaged in the particular circumstances of a termination. So the language in the agreement has to be clear and unambiguous, adopting the tests that courts have uh, taken on employment agreements specifically. It has to meet or exceed the Employment Standards Act entitlements, including those relating to severance pay and benefit continuation. And the employer can't necessarily rely on a clause that says if some part is in, of the uh, provision is in breach of the Employment Standards Act, then it will comply with the ESA, the Employment Standards Act, if that aspect of it, of the agreement, contradicts uh, the remainder of the termination provision. The termination clause is going to be read as a whole, so if the for cause language does not meet the Employment Standards Act entitlements, then the entire termination clause may fall. And that was the holding of coming out of a Court of Appeal for Ontario decision of Waxdale versus Swigon, which was released in June of 2020. And since then, we need to be all the more careful to ensure when we look at these agreements that they do comply with the Employment Standards Act in every respect. And if there is a potential issue with the termination clause, the for cause that can result, for example, that can result in the whole entire clause falling. Employers need to be attentive to ensure that all aspects of the agreement comply or we can end up uh, in a dispute uh, with about whether the agreement is enforceable. The law is also changing constantly. It continues to involve, evolve. And so for this reason, a business should ensure its employment agreements are reviewed regularly to ensure they reflect not just the current state of the law, but also thinking ahead to where is the law going? What legislative changes might be made so that we're drafting the clause in a manner that will uh, increase the likelihood that when you actually go to act on the termination of an employee under a termination clause that we many hopefully many years down the road that it's still a clause that we can rely upon. But getting beyond the contractual la language itself in the agreement, Allison, are there other risks that may limit an employer's ability to rely on a termination clause or other provision in a, of an employment agreement? Yeah, for sure. And there's, there's definitely, I think, three, again, that we would mention here. Uh, first of all, you want to avoid a term sheet or offer that is going to be accepted before the formal employment agreement is signed and put in place. Uh, if you are going to use such a thing as a term sheet, then you want to be very clear that it's not the formal offer or contract uh, to prevent ambiguity and arguments again about what are the enforceable terms that guide the relationship between the parties. Secondly, even if your language in your employment agreement is perfect, if the agreement is not signed by the employee prior to commencing a new job, then it may not be enforceable. So you get a lot of occasions where somebody says, well, you know, I'm going to give them the employment agreement when they come, and then they can look it over and sign it, return it to me first week of the job. You don't want to be doing anything like that. Third, you always need to provide consideration. If you're asking somebody to sign a new contract or they're getting a new position, for example, what this means is that if the employee is already employed with you and you want them to sign a new contract, you have to give them something for it. And it has to be something that has value and they're not already entitled to, for example. So if they normally get a cost of living increase every year, you can't tie that together and say you're only getting your cost of living increase uh, if it, you sign the new contract because that's the consideration. That's probably not valid consideration at that point. So last question for you, Gerald, uh, to wrap us up. Coming out of COVID-19, what are the top three recommendations you'd give to any employer when it comes to an employment agreement? So the top three, in my view, are first of all, make sure you have an agreement that provides flexibility for uncertainty. We've been in a period of accelerated change over this past period of time. We wanna make sure that we have layoff language where it's appropriate to have it, language that deals with changes to work arrangements and locations and duties. And where we do contemplate those types of changes, that can really increase our ability to exercise 
uh, changes to terms and conditions of employment without triggering, for example, a constructive dismissal. The second one is probably the most important one and the one I've addressed is just the importance of a, a properly drafted termination clause. That has huge return on investment, so make sure you have one. The courts, thirdly, courts are always critiquing termination clauses, so it's essential that you have any template language uh, in agreements reviewed regularly to ensure it is still compliant, both with where the law is and the direction of where the case law is going. These are all things that uh, we can certainly help with. And if you do have any questions at all about what we've shared or we can be of any further assistance to you, please feel re free to reach out to either of us. Our contact information is right in front of you. Thanks Thank very you. much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.